at Trek with Dr. Jonathan Crane, and we are in the lychee grove. And in South Florida, we've run into a little problem with lychees, and I was hoping that you could tell everybody about what the problem is, maybe even the origins of it, and then, you know, sort of update us as far as what uh, what's happening and how to treat it. Yeah. So the origin is that this is a mite um, from Southeast Asia. Uh, it's in China, it's in many, many countries, uh, even in Europe, Spain, places like that. Um, and it's a microscopic mite. You do not see the actual mite itself. You see the symptoms of the mite infestation. So it's like the nickname is the leaf curl mite, lychee leaf curl mite. Lychee and, erinose mite. And, but the real name is the erinose oh, yes. mite. Right? Erinose yeah. mite, yeah. So people call it lem or lychee erinose mite. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and um, it was, it, it's been introduced actually into Florida probably twice before and eradicated twice before. But uh, as I remember, it was probably assisted by cold weather. Is, is, you, huh. It seemed like I saw some reference to that. Mm. I don't know about the effect of the, the cold weather. Really, um, I don't know about that, Chris. Uh, but what I do, yeah, I but, but what happened is, unfortunately, it got into some plants that were in a nursery. And then the nursery, you know, unbeknownst to them, had the mite, sold the plants, which distributed it rather quickly in, in about eight counties in Florida. Yeah, the most recent. Uh, the most point. recent yes. introduction. Yeah. And so it was detected and then listed, it's a quarantine pest. Um, and we've had it, uh, what now, I forget, for a number of years now, a couple of years. And the state has, has been making an effort to <laughs> they're not laughing about it uh, to try to eradicate it mm -hmm. um, and it's it's a very difficult pest to control partly because it's microscopic and you don't see it uh, partly because a tree can be infested and you don't see symptoms right away it may be quite a while um, partly because it can be moved by wind currents which is a nightmare um, and also by uh, contamination. So if you go up to a tree and you handle a tree that has the mite and you handle the leaves and then you walk over to another lychee tree or another grove of lychees and handle the tree, you have just transmitted the mite. So it, it's, you know, very disconcerting. The biggest issue with it is, you know, why are we upset about this thing that, that uh, you know, is so small is that in some production areas like Brazil, it has resulted in about an 80% drop in their fruit production. So that's not good. Um, also, if it gets on the fruit and can colonize the fruit, um, you end up with fruit that has this ugly rust colored felt on not, it. Not that saleable. <laughs> not that saleable. Yeah, hard to sell. Um, yeah, really. Uh, red velvet fruit, maybe. Um, <laughs> so it's a problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. There really has been very little biology uh, known about the pest. It hasn't been studied very much. So that's one problem, is we don't know that much about it. And the environmental conditions that, it, it, that facilitate it, or what might control it, things like that. Um, so traditionally or historically, they've been able to somewhat control it with sulfur sprays. However, they're not killing the mite. What, what's happening is you spray the sulfur onto the tree on the new flush or the flower, the new flowering panicles and things like that to prevent the mite from colonizing the tissue. It makes it taste bad? <clears throat> I guess it makes it taste <laughs> bad. Uh, so it's a prophylactic treatment. Uh -huh. It's not a curative treatment. Um, people have tried many insecticides to try to get to this. It, what happens is the mite actually causes, uh, feeds on the back of the leaf actually causes a, a plant growth regulator effect in the lychee leaf itself, we think, and proliferates what's called an erinum, which is like a felt. And it's the small hairs proliferate, the, the natural hairs of the, the tree, of the leaf, and you get this felt-like covering. Um, and almost impossible to penetrate with anything. You can try to spray onto it, you can't get something through that. 
and they're they're attracted to the very <laughs> young leaves too, right? And so it's it's not like you have a long time to to um, get around to spraying. That's it, right. It's like hundred percent. Yeah. Yes, you're exactly right. It, it likes to colonize new flush, new leaves, mm -hmm. and it can be especially a problem. It, it would be one thing if our trees leafed out all at the same time. Yes, there we go. <laughs> and the whole tree at the same time. Yeah, possibly just once a year and too. Possibly <laughs> once a year. That's just not how it goes. Um, so you end up with a tree that might have, you know, some flushing here, some flushing there, a flush that starts, you know, in May and then another flush starts in July and another one in September. So you end up, you know, how, how do you treat this big, huge tree when it's got little patches of new flush all the time. So are these trees treated or some of them treated? Or? Yeah, so this grove right now, we're not treating it with anything. Mm -hmm. Commercially, the, the protocol is in, in order to disinfest your trees of the mite, the, the current protocol is you come in, you remove all the foliage from the tree, remove the foliage, destroy, bury, burn the foliage, and then apply sulfur to what's left of the tree and actually you should in, in many cases if possible and I know they're not doing I know it's not possible everywhere but whitewash the tree if possible yeah prevent the to sunburn, prevent the sunburn yeah. on the on the bark right to prevent the sunburn and then apply sulfur after you've dis, after you've removed all the leaves and the foliage and gotten rid of that apply sulfur and then once the tree begins to regrow you begin applying sulfur every two weeks to protect that new growth. Now, theoretically, when that new growth hardens off, it should be resistant to the mite. However, one of the things that we do see happening is that, of course, when you, when you cut back a big tree to a large wood, as you know, it, it repeatedly flushes. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a matter of, oh, I, I have to protect this one flush. <laughs> no, you need to keep protecting the flushes as they come along. Yeah, the trees want to be big again real quickly. You know, they have a massive trunk and root system and they just grow fast. 100%. Yeah. So it, that's turned out to be a problem, especially people who have mature, large trees. Mm -hmm. Younger trees, not quite as much of a problem. The other issue that we have, of course, in, in South Florida and, and is that we haven't been having cool enough weather to really make the trees dormant during the winter. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, if, if it's warm enough and they have access to water or nutrients, they may flush during the winter. And it may not be the whole tree, but it may be part of the tree. Well, that part that flushes is susceptible to the mite. So you end up having to treat the tree uh, much more often than if the trees were synchronized. Um, so, you know, one strategy, you know, we would recommend to people that, you know, once their trees, it, it, well, let me put it this way. So we'll talk about a grove that doesn't have the mite, is that you do want to prune your trees to try to synchronize your trees, right? So you don't have flushing repeatedly the whole year yeah, to try to have one big flush. Down this Ex grove, yeah. Exactly. But if it's in a grove that has been treated and cut back severely, you're probably going to have to keep treating it. Uh, until it finally slows down, hopefully, um, and get it back into a cycle. And one way to help do that where the whole tree is synchronized in flushing and, and fruiting and flowering is to prune it each year. Um, but that's hard, you know, the economics, it, it's hard to justify, right? So if you're having to repeatedly, Chris, to, to apply sulfur, mm -hmm. and the state has done it in the eradication program for that first flush, right, 12 sprays, I forget exactly how many, then it's on you to do the other, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, it's like the baton, they pass it to right. you. <laughs> it's right. like, uh, yeah, and it is a lot of work. Uh, you know, it's, I, I suppose that if you're used to doing it every two weeks, it's no big right. deal, but in order to, <laughs> uh, you know, like catch the trees every, you know, and have the time to spray that every two weeks. Um, I know that there are, are people, you know, uh, that have a single leech tree and have been treating it exclusively on their own and it's been working out just fine uh, but 
I don't think that that's a, a workable uh, solution for me because I've got a lot of trees and a lot of other trees besides lychee. So, um, yeah, it's, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing that there are still uh, a few, or qu probably quite a few lychee groves in this area that are productive and, you know, yes. they go and just yes. spray yes. everything that they, yes. you know, because it's a one, one crop kind of situation. Right. Uh, so um, yes. I guess that's been working out pretty well. Yeah, so we have a few commercial groves that have been infested um, and some of them have been treated um, and they have, you know, treated the trees with sulfur and if they keep flushing, the owner has been treating the trees. Mm -hmm. Other growers who don't have the pest yet, um, uh, we've recommended to go ahead and spray sulfur whenever they have new flush present they don't have the mite, but as a precautionary measure, why let your trees get infested? Right. If you can afford it and if you can do it uh, on a commercial basis, go ahead and spray sulfur when the trees are flushing. Yeah, and it also, I imagine it makes a lot of economic sense because if you do get the mite, what the the protocol is is to cut the tree way back <laughs> and so you you're losing like possibly three years of yes. production yes. so the yes. prevention is is definitely um, a good way to go if you're able to right um the researchers our, our two of our researchers dr carillo and dr Ravinti, did develop a protocol where people who have fruit um, can disinfest the fruit um, to, in order to sell the fruit. Mm -hmm. But you have to sign a compliance agreement with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Division of Plant Industry. I should just mention the FDAC's Division of Plant Industry is the lead agency on the eradication program. If you suspect you have the lychee irinose mite, you should call their hotline and just let them know. They'll send somebody out to inspect it and look at it. And then eventually they will get to you to treat the trees and start you know the cycle of trying to disinfest the trees um and I, now i forget what i was saying else but anyway so yeah it's not you know certainly not 100 percent satisfactory the idea with that though is that if fdax is able to eradicate it once again um, then we won't have to do this forever so we will see what happens. They're in the midst of it now, um, and they're dealing with, I think it's now 11 counties, uh, maybe yeah. less now because I, they've been successful in eradicating it from several counties uh, already. So hopefully that will keep growing, um, and we'll see what happens. Um, in the meantime, our, our, the researchers, uh, Dr. Carillo and Dr. Raventi, are looking more closely at the life cycles, the biology uh, of those mites, and also testing additional strategies for controlling the mite, mm -hmm. including some new, uh, con some conventional products uh, that could be registered for lychee to, that would, in some cases, be better than sulfur at preventing the mite from colonizing, but also perhaps some materials that could actually kill the mite through that Orinum that's on the back of the leaf. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. I mean, they're in the midst of doing it right now. Yeah. Well, that's good. Uh, yeah. It's nice that that you're working on so many really important things. And this is, uh, you know, we we have quite a few acres. Do you yes. happen to know? Uh, yeah. So how many Florida acres probably we have? has about 1,200 acres of lychee. Um, maybe more because I, I mine is an estimate based on people from other counties and what their estimates are and what they see and then what we have here. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a rough, it's, I'd say it's a rough estimate at best, but I'd say probably 1,200 acres. And we see more going on in up north of Miami-Dade mm -hmm. uh, for certain. So there's more, there's a lot of interest in putting it in north of here. Yeah, it's actually, as I recall, a subtropical tree. Exactly. And so it can take colder temperatures than a, you know, like, for instance, a mango tree. That's right. And so, yes. uh, and it probably actually does better in yes. colder climates. You're 100% right, both things. Uh -huh. Yes, it actually is a subtropical tree and does better where the climate gets cool, especially during the fall and winter and actually stops the tree from growing. Mm -hmm. Down here, it's hard to find enough temperatures, <laughs> to low enough temperatures to slow or stop the tree for very long. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing we're studying uh, besides the mite itself is these flags, the different color flags are different varieties of lychee. We have three different varieties here, Sweetheart, Mauritius, and Brewster, um, is we're monitoring the growth pattern of the trees throughout the year. 
to try to get a better feel for just how often are these flushing? Mm -hmm. Are they flowering? How long is the flushing pattern? How long is the flowering? So we're documenting that here, but also I'm going to uh, two other commercial groves where we're looking at Emperor, uh, Emperor and Mauritius and uh, Brewster at these other commercial groves mm -hmm. to get a feel for what they're doing. Yeah. Oh, great. That's it. Well, thanks very much for the sure. update. Sure. <laughs>